folks. Um, I'm in Oakland, and, and my sister Mary uh, is on the tape. This is Mary Pedrudi Olson. She's she's a descendant also. Pleased to meet you both. Yes, yeah, nice meeting you as well. So nice having you all here. Riley from the UK is coming in. And everyone, if you're watching live, we're just waiting for Mark to come in and then I can You may start. be waiting. We'll just have a little pre-meeting chat. Riley is on his way coming in. He's coming in from the UK. Wow. It looks like he's outside. <laughs> Hi, Riley. He's on his phone. I think so. <laughs> well, the meeting hasn't started yet, Riley. We're just waiting. We're trying to get Mark in. We're having a little technical difficulty. <laughs> Oh, I'm so glad you could all come. Well, I guess I could do my introductions and then we can start with with Joe. Yeah, Mark, want to do Mark will be along shortly. Okay. Hi, everyone watching here yeah. and watching on Facebook. I'm Jill Carlier and I am here um, with the Titanic Book Club and I'm super excited to have you all here. This is our first meeting that we've had in a very long time. We've gone months and months and months without a meeting, so welcome. Today we have two amazing guests, actually three, four, <laughs> to, um, here. Uh, Mark and Joseph Pedrudi are going to be sharing stories with us. Um, what makes them so special is that their, gram their grandmother was a Titanic survivor. So please give a warm welcome. We'll start with Joe here. Hi, Joe. So glad you're here. Hi, Joe. <laughs> Um, my sister Mary is on the right. Oh, I just lost Oops. gallery. I have to go. Here we go. Uh, my sister Mary Pedarudi Olson is on the right. She's um, a descendant as well. And Mark Pedarudi, who's my editor, uh, is trying to find his way into Zoom. He's um, he'll be here shortly. We hope he's. I just heard they're trying to get him in on his phone. Um, where should I start? Um, Mark and I uh, chatted about putting together a book about my grandmother for years. Um, and he really was the prime uh, mover in this project. He instigated it. And I give him credit for providing me with not only editorial assistance, but an entree into the Titanic historic community uh, where we were able to rely on his friends and Titanic historians, um, people who have written books and have published books and who have members of the Titanic International Society. And um, Mark also is the photo historian of our family and is um, literally thousands of family photos starting in the 19th century, going back to our great great parents in Ireland and in Italy. So, you know, we owe a lot to Mark because of his not only his editorial efforts, but also every single photo that you see in the book is um, in from his collection, with a few exceptions where we uh, took some images from Mike Warrior, who's an historian, and Tad Fitch, uh, who also helped us on the project. Um, it was a labor of love. We did it during the COVID pandemic. Um, <clears throat> Mark and I uh, worked together assiduously um, between, you know, mostly I'd say in 2020 and, and spilling over into 2021. It took us a while to get the book published, which is a story I won't get into, but um, we were first timers, newbies, uh, using on, uh, an online publishing based program. Looks like you have another uh, person coming in, Greg. And um, we'll, um, we'll try and get Mark in as soon as possible. 
And what I'd like to uh, also thank my sister Mary, who also uh, helped recollect a lot of these events. Um, she was. We're not going to see it, but you'll hear it. We're going to hear Mark. No, he's going to hear you. He can't get in. Oh, so he's he going to just listen. Oh, so Mark oh, is listening. Sorry. <laughs> oh, we're sorry, Mark. Yeah. Well, so are we. But he's listening to whatever I say. But Mary, um, Mary has provided us with a lot of folklore and, and history, and she remembered things that I didn't remember, like the reception uh, for my grandmother's wedding I was in a certain place. And so we thank her as well. And Mary had an interesting trip to Halifax um, recently. Uh, was it last year? Yeah. We and, were, uh, uh, yeah. Last year in 2020, in the fall of 2020, we went up to Nova Scotia, we went to Halifax and had an opportunity. We were with a tour group, but they were nice enough to uh, uh, circumvent the tour and take us to the, um, the cemetery in Halifax where some of the uh, bodies that were recovered uh, were interned. And then uh, ultimately uh, they were able later, more recently to identify a number of them through DNA and survivors, but many of them were unmarked graves at the time, but it was very uh, moving and a beautiful place to visit. One of, one of the interesting parts of her story is she was on a tour bus and I'll let her tell the story, but... Um... I think she announced to the driver that she was the descendant of the Titanic and the driver immediately gave her his microphone and said, why don't you tell us your story? <laughs> well, actually, um, we got on the subject of the Titanic and I said to the tour guide that I was a descendant and he looked at me in amazement and said, I've never met a descendant, but they have a big <laughs> maritime museum up in Halifax that uh, is most of it is dedicated to the efforts that were made by the people there to uh, go out and recover. Uh, at first, they thought rescue, but then recover. And uh, he said to me, have, I asked him where the cemetery was because Mark had made me aware of it, but I wasn't aware of it. And he said, would you like to go there? And I said, well, yes, I would, but I, you know, I don't know how to get there. And he said, well, it's really not on the tour, but we're going to go there. So he <laughs> turned the bus around and off we went. And uh, uh, when it was over, when I got back on the tour bus, he asked me if I would uh, make a few comments about what my grandmother's story was, which was fine because I had just read Joe and Mark's book. So it was <laughs> clearer in my mind than it had been, but uh, people were captivated. And he said, I've, I've never met a de an actual descendant before. So that was pretty cool. Oh, that's wonderful. So I knew my grandmother, um, I was 12 years old when she passed away. I think Mary, you were seven or? Yeah, seven. Yeah. We're all five years apart. Mark wasn't born. Uh, Mark was born about a year. Yeah, Mark was born. Was a year old. He was a year old when Nana Noon um, passed away. So he, we have photos of him in the baby carriage with Nana, but uh, I don't think he remembers her, but. Uh, we, we have two out of the three descendants who actually uh, knew her and you know, could, we can talk about her characteristics. But I thought we would um, maybe, Jill, if you wanna introduce the other people who have joined us. Okay, let's put you all on. A couple of other people. View. That's a great idea. So we have here, Joseph Petteruti, the author of the wonderful book. And we have Mary Olson, Joseph's sister. They're both um, the grandchildren of Bertha Mulvihill. Did I say that right? Correct. And, and then we have Cliff Ismay here. He is has he's an author and also a family member of Bruce Ismay. And he just came out with a book about his family member. Um, 
Gosh, and the title is blanking me out right now. Sorry. And we have, and he's here from, Cliff, where are you here from? You, you all can unmute if you want to say hi. We also have Riley here from the UK. We have Bruce Kaplan here, another author. Um, and we have, oh, that's a pleasure <laughs> to be here. Yeah, I would let you all say hi. And Terry Bay, she's with the uh, with, uh, um, book club. And we have Greg, and Greg is saying hi in the chat. Everyone can um, unmute if they'd like to. We have a nice small group. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Just want to say a quick hi. hi. Hey, Cliff, what's up? Hi, hey, how are you? Good. <laughs> we nice can't meet you. Jill, you asked me earlier, the title of the book is Understanding J. Bruce's Yes, Mouth. thank you. I'm it's sorry. Fine. I've blanked out. It's, it's, it's fine. It's fine. Um, and I live in, in on the west coast of England, northwest coast of England. Um, so, so, yeah, as I was saying before, it's night time here. And I will have to say hands up. I'm absolutely full of flu, the virus. <laughs> so if I if I disappear, apologies in advance to everyone. Did you say you have the flu? The flu, yeah. Oh, Not wrong, I'm sorry. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. I thought it might have been the coronavirus, but I've had about six tests and they're all negative, so it must <laughs> be the flu. But there we go. Oh, I hope you feel better. I'm so you. glad you could come in. You want to say hi, so Bruce? Oh, yeah. Hello, everyone. And it's just I've always told Jill, I just really enjoy being uh, connected with this wonderful book club. And uh, it's so fascinating, all the facts that we learn. It really is. Do you want to say hi, Greg? <laughs> Sorry, that's my... <laughs> That I made a spooky ringtone. <laughs> <laughs> a whistle. <laughs> it's like a spooky. It's almost um, that time of the month, Jill. Excuse me? It's almost that time of the month. Yes, ring. it is. We're getting close to Halloween. So yeah. I thought I would. Uh, I don't know if Riley or Greg want to say hi. Yeah, I think I'm too old to go trick or treating, but I still, <laughs> you know, uh, remember the good old days. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we're doing a little trunk or treat at my church where everyone fills their trunks with candy and the kids come and play games. And... Yeah, I I, uh, I do some radio shows and on my radio show, I told the story when I was about uh, nine years old, I went and knocked at this lady's door on Halloween night and she handed me a $5 bill and I was <laughs> so thrilled until I found out she screamed at me about a half a block away. When I was a half a block away, uh, she thought I was the paper boy. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I thought that was—I thought that was really a nice, uh, a, a wonderful uh, lady that gave out five-dollar bills. <laughs> so. I, I always like the cultural differences over here. We don't do trick or treat. It's penny for the lantern, and we don't use it traditionally. We don't use a pumpkin. That we're catching up now. We use a, a turnip or snanny, as we call it in the Cumbrian dialect. It's very similar to we carve it out as you do with a pumpkin, put a candle in the hole in the top, and we just go around knocking on people's doors, penny for the lantern. Um, but I think that that tradition is kind of going now. We get more of the trick or treat. Uh, and I, I remember when it first was first introduced over here in the UK. We used well, I didn't know that I was past that, but. Kid used to knock on the door, trick or treat. And I said, I don't like the sound of that. You know, I don't like the trick part of it. But of course, <laughs> it's become a part of popular culture now, isn't it? I've I've heard of people giving out pennies. That's what they did when I was a kid. Never five dollar bills though. <laughs> <laughs> no. Too bad. Yeah. My mother used to let us go home and change into another outfit and go to this one neighbor's who gave out the big <laughs> full-size candy bars. <laughs> hey, should we do your um, presentation? Sure. Why don't we go to the slideshow? Um, and Mary, I want you to chime in uh, if, if you can on any of these slides. Because okay. you may remember something I don't. 
And Greg Jasper's here too, and his microphone and camera aren't working, but he says okay. hello, and I can told him I could speak for him from through the chat. We have a chat feature. In here. Okay, can you guys see that? Okay. Yes. First of all, the name of the book is The Night She'd Remember, and I shamelessly borrow The Night to Remember from Walter Lord and changed it to A Night She'd Remember. But I, I, I give all of the acclaim to the title to Walter Lord, and I will tell you an interesting story that um, my grandmother um, was invited to the world premiere of the movie of Night to Remember in 1958 and um, she declined to go. Um, she said emotionally she, she wouldn't be able to uh, make the trip and, and see the movie. But she, she was invited um, and she was a member of the Titanic community. Um, she helped raise funds for um, a memorial to uh, Guglielmo Marconi in 1937. Um, she used her name as a, as a fundraiser. So she was active, an active member like we are in the Titanic community. And she, uh, she, while she didn't speak very much about it in her early life um, when she was a mom, uh, she did spend a lot of time with my sister Paula and I telling us the tales of the Titanic. And I'm sure Mary got involved in, as well. And we knew the story um, from Nana. Um, and she told it with, you know, a, uh, not, not a sense of uh, joy, but like a sense of accomplishment that she had um, made it through. And she had her own, uh, recollections of the events, which were very different from what we all read about in the 50s and 60s, which was the wealthy um, people, the first class passengers. So we'll start at the, the next slide. Okay. This is, um, this is a photo of the pendant watch um, that my grandfather Noon gave to my grandmother. Bertha Mulvihill in 1910. Bertha had traveled from um, Ireland to the United States and um, she lived with her aunt and um, she also moved in with her sister, Minnie. Aunt Kate um, had traveled from Ireland. I think Mary, was she a Mulvihill or was she a Aunt Kate was Martin Mulvihill's sister. So right. our grandmother's fa father's sister was Bertha's aunt. And she had already s settled in Rhode Island. And she sent, or the, the Mulvihills in Athlone wanted the girls, and it was Nana and uh, her sister to go to the United States because they felt it wasn't safe at that time, which was in the early 1900s, for the girls to be in uh, Ireland because of all the uprising there and the black and tans were raping and pillaging in the towns. So they sent the two girls to uh, live with Aunt Kate in Providence, Rhode Island. So that's how she initially came to the United States and then subsequently met her future husband. Right, and Henry Noon was a master molder and he worked at a local manufacturing company called Brown and Sharp. And um, he made a, a very good paycheck and he bought her this gold watch for an engagement gift uh, for in December of 1910. And uh, this was the first of three uh, gifts that he gave her before they were married. I'm gonna show you the next one uh, now. This is a bangle bracelet, which has a filigree pattern, which you cannot see um, on, the, uh, on the bracelet, but it's 
it's gold and it uh, she wore that on her wrist um, as she jumped into lifeboat 15 and as she had her pendant watch pinned, I believe it was on her overcoat. Um, and she also had a third gift, which would be the next slide. This was a cross and chain, uh, it was another gift from Henry. So all of these gifts uh, remain with us today. They are under lock and key and uh, under the um, safeguard of an attorney. And um, <clears throat> we, uh, we are planning and still trying to find a home for these artifacts. We, we know they're uh, priceless. Um, we have uh, some thoughts about museums. My uncle Henry Noon, who was Bertha's youngest child, uh, wanted us to leave these artifacts in Rhode Island so that family members here could um, look at them when, when they wanted to. Um, but all the great Titanic museums seem to be across the world somewhere, Belfast or whatever. I will say that a hat of my grandmother sits in the Belfast Museum. And Mark, what's the name of that museum? The Ulster. Ulster Museum in Belfast. The hat that she wore um, in New York City when she arrived on the Carpathia from uh, the Titanic um, gave her a gray felt hat. And that is also uh, in a museum, in the, in the Ulster Museum. So um, those are the three gifts. And uh, we'll go to the next slide. Now on this slide, you'll notice uh, there's five or six people. This is Bertha's um, employer in 1911. She worked at the Perry House, which was a restaurant and a bar and hotel. A hotel too. And, and a hotel. Thanks, Mark. And um, she was um, in, the, in the Gilded Age in Newport. Uh, the Astors visited um, the Perry House. And, who knows if she ever met them, but um, her tips and her wages were enabled her to buy passage on the Titanic to return to her homeland to tell her parents that she was engaged. And uh, she was also standing in for her sister, uh, Kitty, um, who is uh, married, I think in 1911, but had her first child just about the time that Bertha arrived. And so she, Bertha was a stand in as a grant, um, as the um, great godmother. godmother, the godmother of Mora. And we have um, in the book a, a reference to Mora about Fox. Mora Fox. Um, and she claimed that Bertha. Um, was a very adventurous person. And uh, even though she didn't know her, she, um, she said that uh, she would have loved to have met her and spent time with her. So the next slide. Oh, Bertha is on the left in the big hat. Um, first woman in on the uh, left. And um, her coworkers are sitting with her. So you can see she's wearing a dress that looks like she could have been on the Titanic on that particular day. Yeah, she's that's beautiful. All, all dressed and has a beautiful hat. Uh, and you notice the other women's hats, they all look like the, uh, the era of the Titanic. So that, that's a very early photo of Bertha. She was born in 1886. So in this particular time period, she's in her you know, early to mid twenties and getting ready to travel back to uh, Ireland to say, to tell her family that she was getting engaged. So the next slide. Okay. Um, this is Bertha and her husband, Henry in 1920. And these are, this is my aunt, Mary, 
who was six years of age, approximately, and my mom, Frances, who was about four. And I think they're in the backyard on Lisbon Street, uh, which is where the Noon family lived, um, Henry Noon lived. Um, and I think they are facing Chalkstone Avenue right. in the back. And so this is what my mom and my Aunt Mary looked like. Aunt Mary was very tall. And my mom was petite. She was only five feet. And uh, but they were both uh, beautiful little girls. And they were also very beautiful women when they grew up. So the next slide. Okay, here's a portrait of 1928 of the four daughters. From the left is um, my mom's younger sister, Ruth, who was two years younger. And then Mary is second in, is um, two years older than my mom. And then, the, then my mom, who was about 12. So Mary's, about, uh, Mary's probably around 14. Ruth is probably around 10. And uh, the, the little girl on the right is Helen. Who, who tragically died um, in an automobile accident on Chalkstone Avenue in front of their house on the night before Christmas Eve in 1928. So it's, this is one of the last photos that we have of Helen before she was killed by a drunken driver on Chalkstone Avenue. So the little boy in the background, Mary, your guess is as good as mine. Or Mark. That's Paulie Norton. Paulie Norton. He was <laughs> a he, cousin. He was, he's he's my mom's cousin, and uh, he lived over on Ingerman Street. Yeah, I think we have Smith Hill Ingerman area. Street. Yeah. So uh, I do remember my mom saying that Paulie tortured her, and he was <laughs> he he was kind of ex bad boy. So the significance again of this photo is we have um, all the children, but Henry, Henry was born the youngest member of the family right after Helen's death. Uh, he was born in February of 1929. Um, so they went from um, the grief, the sorrow of a, a passing of a, of a daughter to the the beautiful birth of a, a first son in the family, my uncle Henry. <clears throat> so we don't see him yet in this photo. Next, please. And here's a, a photo from the 1940s. Um, and this is my grandfather on the left. And story, interesting story about him is he was working at Brown and Sharp Foundry in you know, in the late 30s, probably 39, maybe early 40, um, he had an industrial accident. He was a molder and a piece of, you know, the fiery molten uh, bronze, 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 bronze was, you know, shot up and hit him in the eye. He wasn't, he, it was a hot day in July and he wasn't wearing his helmet his safety goggles. So he, he lost his eye. And as a result of that, um, Brown and Sharp um, basically demoted him. They gave him a paycheck, but it was much less than the one he was making. And he became an instructor and a, uh, someone who would teach the younger people how to do his job. So it must have been heartbreaking, not only for my grandfather, Henry, but also the whole family because it was the depression and uh, they lost a good part of their income. So this is, this, is a, this is a significant photo because if you look at Henry's face, you might see he had a frosted lens over the right, his, his left eye. So you'd be looking at him on the right, you'd see a frosted lens, but I'm not sure you can see that in the photo. Mm -hmm. He had a, um, a operation where they uh, put a glass eye into the socket, but he, he was very proud and he didn't want anyone to be looking at his glass eye. So 
he had not only that, but he had the frosted lens over his glasses. So he died a few years after this. So we'll go to the next photo. And now we're in the 1950s. Um, Bertha is on the left wearing her St. Patrick's Day hat, as well as uh, me in the bed. I was sick in bed, as, as is usual during this era. I had a lot, of, uh, a lot of days out of school during this time period. And my sister Paula is in back of me. Uh, she's five years older than I am. She's deceased. Um, she died young. She died when she was 65 um, after an operation on her heart. Then my mom is sitting with Mary on the right hand side. So my mom <laughs> is holding Mary and Mary, I think you were about one or two. No, I think you I was about you three. A little older than that, yeah. So we used to call her Maydoll. She got a nickname from my uncle Wade when he called her Maydoll. And, um, that evolved over the years to May May and other nicknames. Well, well, uh, <laughs> St. Patrick's Day was always a big event at our house, even though we had a Petarudi surname. But the Irish side prevailed, especially on St. Patrick's Day. And my grandmother, I remember her receiving from Ireland. And I don't know how they did this in those days, but she used to get a little plant of shamrocks and from her family that they sent them to the house, her house on Wyndham Avenue. And I always thought that was pretty cool that they could mail shamrocks to her. But she never let us forget that we were Irish too. And uh, we had lots of corned beef and cabbage at all times. <laughs> My mom was a very good cook and she could um, cook not only the Irish English, because her dad was English and mom was Irish, but she marrying my dad, uh, she also learned how to cook from my Italian grandmother, uh, Mary Canavo. And we all so had she was a lot of food. <laughs> we had a, always had a lot of food. We we went from spaghetti and meatballs and lasagna to corned beef and cabbage. So the next slide, please. Now, this is a, a nice photo of my uncle Henry. He's he was born in uh, 1929, and this is I think this is around 1956 because um, we're, we're seeing two young children, Karen and Lynn, the Henry Henry's daughters. Karen is in the uh, is on Henry's lap, and um, she's probably just over a year old, and Lynn is was only about. She was born in the same year as Karen. They were both, both born, I think, in 1955. Irish twins. Irish twins because they were both born in the same year. Um, but Lynn, I would imagine she's about nine months in that photo, and Karen's probably a year and a half. And the, there's my grandmother um, holding and her youngest granddaughter in the, the little dolly. And that's yeah. in the breezeway of a house on Sharon Street where we were brought up. Anything else, Mary? No, I think that, you know, Nana passed away like two years later, but she did get to see her youngest child marry yeah. and start a family. So that was nice for her. And ultimately they ended up, that family ended up living in the house that um, the Noon family, Earth is raised her family and, or at least right. when they were a little bit older on Wyndham Avenue. So right. that house was in our family or, or in a, a family member owned it up until probably the late eighties. Yeah. Bertha was her own general contractor in 1928 when she built 28 Wyndham Avenue. And uh, she took out a mortgage and she used some of, I believe she took some money out of her Titanic uh, funds as a result of the settlement with White Star Line. Um, and she bought, she built not only a house, but she furnished the house with some of that money. And then the house stayed, as Mary said, in the family. Henry lived there with four children right up until, I guess, the early 80s. 
late, late 70s, early 80s. So the next slide is again, um, Bertha, St. Patrick's Day, 1958. What's interesting about this is if you look in the mirror, you can see a mirror image of her profile, which is kind of neat. And she's, my mom bought a bouquet of flowers for St. Patrick's Day. Bertha had her St. Patrick's Day hat on. And um, so there was always a celebration in our house uh, on St. Patrick's Day with, with Nana there. And then the following slide. Uh, this is the Noon Family Memorial at St. Francis Cemetery in Providence. Uh, if, if you enlarge the photo, you can see that Bertha was born in 1887. I put a question mark on that because all of our recollections. Yeah, the, thanks. So uh, thanks for doing that. I've never done this on my computer before. Let me see if I can get it. Bring it. Good job. Wow. I yeah, it says 1887 is her birth date, but everything that we look at is says 1886. And I don't know why a family member at the time of her internment in 1959 would have gotten her birth date wrong. Uh, my mom told me one time that my birth, that Bertha wanted to be younger than she was so that Henry wouldn't think um, Henry was just a little bit older than she was, maybe a couple of years older. And my mom said Bertha maybe had lied about her birth date at one point to make herself younger. So that, that could have something to do with it, but I don't, I can't imagine um, I just Henry. <laughs> yeah. I can't imagine that like, they got this wrong with, you know, I, I just don't you know how it happened. Do you want to say anything about the fact that she was born Bridget? Yeah, her, her name, her birth name, as Mark just told me, was Bridget. And um, when she came to this country, there were a lot of maids. Mark, do you want to speak? I'll let you speak. Well, I don't know. Can I speak on here? Yes. Yeah, we can hear um, you. Okay, well, sorry about that I can't connect. But anyway, uh, when she came to America, a lot of the maids and were called Bridget. And so she didn't want to be referred to as a maid. So she changed her name to Bertha. <laughs> and Mark, tell the story about how when she was a maid um, on the oh, east side of the province. Yeah. Her first job in America was to work for a wealthy woman on the east side of Providence. And she, the woman was really um, too much. Demanding. <laughs> What's that? She was demanding. She was very demanding. And Bertha got very sick and tired of working there because she kept ringing the bell. There was a button she under the table in the dining room table where she could press her foot on it to ring a bell. So she kept ringing the bell and, and Bertha got mad and quit. <laughs> she packed her bags and went to the back door. Went back to Aunt Kate's house. <laughs> <laughs> so she, <laughs> she, she got a head of steam on her and she just moved on. It was, I might add, never was. Uh, when I had the opportunity about 10 years ago to go to Athlone to the town where my grandmother was born and we still have family members there. And I met my cousin, Aiden, who, um, Aiden Mulvihill, who uh, showed me around and he uh, told, he referred to my grandmother, even though he never met her, but all his uh his grandparents and grandparents and th that generation referred to her as Bridie because her name was Bridget and they didn't understand this Bertha thing that, <laughs> that wh where did that come from because she was really Bridie, Bridie Mulvihill and uh, the, the Mulvihill family has a big clan but he told me that uh, Bridget was the most famous of all the Melvilles because of her 
um, surviving the Titanic. And she came from a, fam a very large family. Uh, I think it was 11 children. And um, she, it, it must have been really difficult for her to leave um, that family. They had a farm uh, in Athlone. They were pretty close to the Shannon River. And she spoke about going into the river and, and netting, netting salmon. And uh, father had a farm. They were tenant farmers. They didn't own the land. But uh, they had a pretty nice life in Ireland, but then the, the troubles came along with, you know, Britain and whatnot. So they, the ladies, the, the older daughters left to go to America to make their way. It was interesting for me to see the original homestead, which now is more like a stable and that was very primitive. Uh, and uh, the whole family lived in this small little building, but uh, yet education was really valued. And my grandmother and her siblings, her sisters, went to the Catholic school in Athlone and uh, completed the 12th grade. My grandmother was very articulate, literate, wrote beautifully, uh, knew, was more of a like a liberal arts uh, background. Uh, and when she came to the United States, uh, she could have been qualified to do anything, but there was a lot of discrimination against the Irish in those days. Uh, so <laughs> while she didn't like being a maid and she didn't end up doing that, she found a lot of other opportunities uh, in the new world. And uh, that was uh, why she had decided to stay. Mark, why don't you tell them about the Rumford Baking? Powder company. Oh, she worked in a company called the Rumford um, Chemical. Chemical Works. And I don't know if she packed baking powder, but they made baking powder, which I guess back then was something new. And so, like, she, she would pack baking powder. Right. She, she and that was, in the, that was in East Providence, Rhode Island. Right. And then I think and then, then she went on to be working at the Perry House. And I don't know if she like she probably stayed at Newport because it's a long distance from Providence, but she probably stayed at this place for like the summer. Right. I can't imagine her taking a train back and forth. No. But, you know, I would think that she lived there. They had servants' quarters for the the people that worked there. Now, Jill, where did you get this photo? <laughs> I think Mark's been forwarding. <laughs> Mark, you secretly sent a photo. Yes, Mark sent me that. So I thought I'd show Mark's. Isn't that, can't see. I think that was like two weeks ago when we were all together. <laughs> we were all together for Mark's birthday. Right. And uh, this is Mary's beautiful home, which is on the Cape. And um, she entertains us quite a bit. And so we had a delicious luncheon at Mary's house and we got to talk to uh, each other, very close as siblings. And uh, we're all five years apart. Um, I'm the oldest now, Paula, my sister Paula was the oldest, but uh, I'm, I'm now a man of a certain age in the seventies. Mary, we don't talk about her age. She's much younger than I am. I'm glad that you but, clarified the fact that you're the oldest. Because <laughs> looking at that picture, I'm not so sure. <laughs> Mark is I'm, the baby. I'm still, I'm still the baby. He's always the baby. <laughs> He's the baby. I just turned before. So, Mark, you're giving away everyone's age now. <laughs> 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 That's okay. Oh, Mark is a young 64. Mark we're owns here. his own That's dog. Most important thing we're here. Well, Mark owns his own um, store in Provincetown with his husband, and uh, it's called Botanica, and they uh, have a very successful operation. They've been in business now how many years, Mark? Ten, ten years. Yeah, your 10th anniversary. 
and uh, they sell giftware and plants and statuary and you tell them what else. And Joe's like book. <laughs> garden shop. Yeah. It's garden shop. It's a garden shop, but they don't sell as many plants as what he used to do when he was in Philadelphia and he had a garden shop. But Mark has a degree in horticulture from the University of Rhode Island and has spent his entire life uh, in the world of plants and uh, set in soil science and loves, loves his life on the Cape. I think that that part of Mark's um, vocation came from my grandmother's side of the family because she grew up on a farm and uh, my aunt Ruth loved gardening, right, Mark? And she really got you interested in gardening when you were a little boy. Yeah, my, my aunt Ruth taught me all about gardens when I was a little kid and taught me how to grow things. And I, she took that over from her mother. So then I learned from Aunt Ruth how to grow seeds and plant gardens. And you know I was doing it when I was really young. So that's how I got interested in plants. My grandmother uh, loved to grow flowers. And my mom told us a story of um, how during the, uh, I think it was the 1920s, they would walk over to their a plot, which was a victory garden, and they would grow vegetables and flowers on Wyndham Avenue, and it was at the top of the hill looking out over the city. And, you know, my grandmother would you know, love to plant flowers around um, in her victory garden. And it ended up that they bought that plot of land for the house on Wyndham Avenue. Didn't she say that it reminded of, a, of her of Ireland yes. because she was up on a hill? Right. And it, it was like overlooking the, the city. Right. It was a view of skyline view of Providence at the top of the hill. And also at that time was, you know, it was pretty uh, heavily forested. Um, lots of what kind of trees were on window? Oak or? Oaks and elms, I elms. think. Yeah, a lot of elm trees that. There was a, a Elmhurst Academy uh, had a complete um, campus filled with uh, elms. Right. So the place that she uh, built, her home that she built on Wyndham Avenue was quite beautiful. It was a four bedroom square colonial, colonial. And she planted lots of flowers around her house. I, I think one thing I might want to add and I don't want to um, take away from did you hear like that? Even, but, uh, when, when I went to Ireland and for the first time heard from the other side of the family, from, the other, from across the pond about what their uh, stories were about my grandmother going to America. Uh, you know, when she went back to visit her family before she uh, married. It was kind of a controversial thing for her to announce her engagement because her uh, fiance, my grandfather, was of English descent. And uh, he was a Catholic, but he was English. And her family did not like that at all. <laughs> and they wanted her to stay now that she had lived in America for a few years, quite a few years, they, they decided that now she was about to make a bad mistake and that she needed <laughs> to come back to Ireland. So she extended her stay. And my mother always said that she was having too good a time. <laughs> and uh, They were trying to convince her by having her not only see family members, but go to parties or whatever that, that she shouldn't make this mistake. And uh, in the meantime, my grandfather or her fiance was back in the United States working and they had agreed that they were going to build a three family house. At the time it was two families, but then they added a third floor. And that was going to be where they would live across the 
the uh, yard from his family. So the family was building this house and it was in the 20s. And uh, at that time, uh, normally you would uh, live on the Sec on the second floor of a tenement house and, and rent out the first floor for a higher rent. So the house got completed and Henry now is communicating by mail with Bertha saying, when are you coming back? Because she <laughs> wasn't exactly in any hurry to get back because mm -hmm. if you don't get back soon, we're gonna have to rent out both floors. So that's when she decided as she was walking through the town of Athlone, she saw a sign in the travel agent window that the Titanic was uh, taking its maiden voyage and uh, it was going to be leaving from Kobe. And uh, there were some other people from her town that she could travel with. So she went and bought the ticket to go back because things were hanging in the balance back in Rhode Island if she didn't get back there quickly. <laughs> so uh, I, I thought it was kind of interesting because apparently the Mulvihill side of the family wasn't really aware until the last minute that she was going on the Titanic. And uh, then of course, you know, the, the die was cast and she was going with these other people that she traveled with. But I, I might add, she wanted to surprise Henry, uh, and she she told him that she was, you know, she did she didn't tell him which ship she was on. She wanted to surprise him, I think, by being on the Titanic and, and announcing it. But he wasn't really even sure uh, whether she was on the ship until he read the, I think it was the New York Times, no, the Providence Journal, and he looked at the survivor list. Uh, and it said Miss Bertha, Miss Bertha just, just Miss Bertha. And he said, oh my God, she's on the Titanic. <laughs> I've got to go and see her. I've got to pick her up. So he took, um, he and his brother-in-law, Ted Norton, jumped on the train and went down to uh, New York City, got off at Grand Central and um, walked over to the uh, dock the where the Carpathia had just landed and Bertha, you know, was walking along the dock and saw Henry. He didn't see her, but she walked up from behind and she put her hands over his eyes like this and said, guess who? Uh -oh. And he turned her around and said, oh my God, you're, you're back. Uh -oh. And they went yeah. right back. She was supposed to go to the hospital the, the passengers were supposed to have gone, all, all of the uh, passengers that were the uh, survivors were supposed to go to St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Brooklyn, but she demurred. She went out the back, the back hatch where they were unloading the luggage, jumped off the boat onto the dock. And this is with broken ribs and heavily injured from her, her fall into the lifeboat. Uh, but she was able to uh, jump off the uh, the Carpathia and find her betrothed Henry on the dock. Oh, right. well, they took the train back to Providence. And they took the train back to Providence. She said, take me home. And then they that was in April and they were married in August of that year. Right. And my mother and my aunt, Henry, because they had first hand knowledge, said that when my grandmother returned to, to Rhode Island, uh, because the news of the Titanic was so um, extensive, the coverage, that she was kind of like a celebrity, which she did not like. She felt she was really uh, had post-traumatic uh, stress and syndrome because, uh, and in those days, they just said she had nerves, but she really felt, she saw, a, you know, a family from her town parish, she saw people dying, and she didn't really want to talk about it, but the, the paparazzi of that era were all around her house, they found out when she was getting married, they came to the 
uh, church and kind of swarmed her. In fact, her she she hopped a fence in the backyard and her veil got caught on a rose bush. Isn't that right, Mark? Right. She had she jumped up on a on a on a I guess like a garbage can and jumped over the fence and then her veil got caught in the rose bush and that's why her picture of her wedding picture doesn't have a veil. It's just like a hat on top. She had she had all her trousseau, all the things that her sisters and family members had made for her while she was in Ireland having a good time, uh, were, were lost when uh, the ship went down. But uh, she had a painting of Robert Emmett that she loved, and that went down too. Yeah. Robert Emmett was a patriot um, in the history of Ireland. And her wedding gown, right? She was. And her wedding gown, a beautiful wedding gown. Yes. All hand sewn by her sister, who was a seamstress. Mm -hmm. I think that was the most heartbreaking thing I read in her story. One of the most. <laughs> That's what some of our friends said. Because it was her, her sisters in Ireland, right, that had made that when she was there. Right. Some of my friends who read the book said, oh, I, I was so upset when I heard that the steamer went to the bottom of the ocean with all of her. True. So, so what about the, the, all the people that died? <laughs> so I, I know it's terrible, <laughs> but I was so concerned my, about my grandmother true. had a feisty spirit. You know, she she didn't stay locked down in steerage. She crawled up on the rail and jumped. You know, she she was escaped out of the back of the Carpathia and went down below because she wasn't going to the hospital. She had her own way of doing. <laughs> was always, you know, in, uh, instilled in us as well, because that gen their, her children <laughs> carried that <laughs> onto the next generation, but she blazed her own trail. Yeah. <laughs> the aunts and the Do uncles. Do you want to say anything about um, Eugene Daly? Oh, oh he was talk about her. Yeah. Jill, do we have enough time for Mark to talk? Yeah, sure. We, we were able to arrange to make the meeting longer. So as long as you guys are able to stay, that's we're, we're got We want to open it for Q and A though. That's, that's yeah. why. Do do yeah, that? so when, when, how much time do you, you know, we don't want to wear you out so we can set our. A few minutes. Okay. <laughs> uh, we, let's, let's do 10 minutes if we have 10 okay. minutes. Did I, I do have a question. But you had a story. Do you want to do your story first? Oh, me? Yeah, your story, Mark, about uh, oh, Eugene Daly. Oh, well, Eugene Daly was from the same town that Bertha was, and they had known each other through high uh, grammar school, I guess. And um, they, they went together on the Titanic, and she, he, was, he was to look after her. And also his cousin, Margaret Daly, was in the same, uh, I guess, the same room that Bertha was in on the Titanic and their, their, their accommodations were near the boilers. So when that hit the iceberg, she knew that something was wrong because it was a, quite a jolt. But Eugene Daly and her kept in touch for years but i guess was it in the 20s that he wanted her to get on a stage or something and well, then, that, uh, from what mom said was that in those days there were a lot of vaudeville shows that would you know tour and and providence had big theaters and eugene daly came to her house when she was married and had children and said you know bertha would you come and i'm going to play the Uline pipes, right, Mark? Is that yeah. how you, then, the you can get on the stage and sit in a wheelchair <laughs> and tell your story <laughs> and and we'll make lots of money. And she just had didn't want to have anything to do with that. She just thought that was awful to make money on a tragedy. So right. she 
like got upset with him and I don't know if she talked to him ever again. Mm -hmm. but that was the end of her friendship with Eugene Daly. But Eugene Daly saved himself on the Titanic. He, he I think he um, boarded collapsible B and uh, was able to save himself. And uh, he- uh, His legs hung in the water. Yeah, he, he was frostbite. frostbitten and uh, had really terrible, uh, terrible time out at sea until they picked him up, the Carpathia picked him up. But he was the bagpiper on board the Titanic. I, I think that in the Titanic movie, the character was uh, fashioned after Eugene Daly, right, Mark, the piper? Hey, yeah, I think you're right. right. So I we saw that hat. Yeah, so we I have a that. question that went along with this hat here. Thank you for sharing that. Let me. Um... Okay, so um, Gertrude Schmidt, she's a book club member, and she took this picture while she was at the Ulster Folk and Transport Museum. And she said, this is the hat that someone gave her when she arrived in New York, Bertha. Does she know who <laughs> gave it to her? Or was it a stranger? That's not true. I it's not think. true. Okay, so that must be the story that they are giving at the museum. Maybe. I, I, Mark, do you want Mark. to talk about that? Yeah. yeah, I think, well, she got to New York and it was a cold, rainy night. And she was shivering. And some poor, some man along the dock put the hat on her head and said, you know, he felt bad for her because, you know, all these people got off and they were walking on the dock and they had like, you know, she basically had her night clothes on and her coat and, you know, she had no socks on. She had shoes with no socks. So, I mean, she must have been freezing, you know, it was damp and cold. And so the man put the hat on her head and said, keep warm. Something was like that in the Mark or on the, or on the Carpathia? No, that was, was at the dock was, in New York. The dock of the, in New York of the Carpathia. Yeah. I don't know, do you think it was on the Carpathia that she No, got no, we did some research on that, Mark. And it, was, it was New York. It yeah. was in New York, okay, that's what she- All right, I stand yeah. corrected. Now, did, she, didn't you, Uncle Henry, say that that hat hung on the back of the door. He used like to, up. we have pictures of Uncle Henry. He used to wear it um, when he was playing when he was about 12 years old and it got all beat up. And, you know, he really abused that hat. But <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, that hat, it was, I think Uncle Henry gave the hat to one of his yeah. relatives. Yeah, there was a woman who came from Ireland in the 70s, and I remember. Uh, he gave the hat to her, and she said that she would get it to someone in a museum. But that was like in the seventies, and then it just disappeared. Right. And I think mom was mad that like he gave the hat away, and we'd never see it again. But then all of a sudden, it, it was in the museum, and that lady who uh, you know created that um, thing at the Ulster Museum, she called me up. And we talked for like months and she wanted to know all about the hat and my grandmother. And so like I told her everything and then she was able to take pieces of the pictures and all and piece it all together. And it went into that museum, which was kind of neat. Oh. So do they still have that hat today then? I think in the, the it's in the museum. In the museum. Yeah, okay. Oh, that's what she's in, in, this, in this big case, there's a like a, it talks about classes and it has um, Bertha's hat on a mannequin, and then right next to it, it has uh, Lady Duff Gordon's Lady evening wear. Duff with... Gordon's uh, uh, kimono or something that she wore, oh. and then it has then there's like a toolbox that someone else had, I think. So is that hat on loan, she wanted to know, or um, do they own it now? No, I think it's a permanent, it's in the permanent collection. 
Okay. You know, we gave it to them. Okay, great. Wow, does anyone else have any questions? Terry has a question. Go ahead, Terry. Hi, how are you? Um, I have a quick question. Um, you said that she, I guess very early, she never talked about the Titanic. Did she, um, like every time April, 4th, April 15th or the 14th came around each year, did she ever, you know, feel any, you know, did her mood change on every time though that day came around or knew of or? I don't know. Do I don't know. I, I, you know, I only spent from age you know like age four or five when i knew her to age 11 or 12 so i don't remember her mood changing on that day i you know i i, I can't answer that question either but uh my grandmother had a lot of sadness in her life because in those days she had to leave her family in ireland to come to the states and they're they're only you know it was, when you think about it my mother said that whenever she would get a letter from Ireland, that could change her mood because um, sometimes it told stories about her loved ones passing away. Sometimes it told happy stories about births. And, but, um, and I think the whole tragedy of the Titanic overshadowed her life. And while she was a lot of fun on a lot of different occasions, I think that you know, it was kind of like uh, the dark side of the Irish. She always, you know, had a, a certain amount of sadness too. And she lost a child. Uh, she never saw her family again. Her parents passed away. She never saw her siblings again. It wasn't like today when you could hop on a plane and, and go over and visit. My mom said to me one time that Nana said to my mother, the worst sickness in the world is homesickness. And that struck me as, you know, telling me everything I needed to know about how much she did miss Ireland and her family. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question? I really appreciate you guys taking the time to come. And I have a, I have a question for Cliff. Oh, good. <laughs> Cliff, what, what is the name of your book again? I missed it. Hi. Well, I don't have to understand me in your party, but my book was Understanding J. Bruce's May subtitle, The Man They Called the Coward of Titanic. So it's, 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 it's out in the UK now. Um, it's actually available in the state side from the 1st of November. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll and show you. I find it interesting. And how how are you? I don't think, if you're wondering if Bruce had any, any, anything to do, well, thank you, Jill. If you're wondering if Bruce had anything to do with um, your grandma on the, I think she was on Lifeboat 15, uh, I think it said, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but Bruce did not actually have any interaction with Lifeboat 15. And, and Cliff, what are you a great grandchild or no. what, no, what no, is your no. relationship? No, it's not, not, not that close. My relationship's much, much wider. Um, to be exact, I would be Bruce's fifth cousin once removed. So our this great, great, great grandfathers were brothers. But the, the, the book I, I wrote was, a lot of it was based on information from Bruce's great-grandson who lives in Scotland, who prefers anonymity. But yeah, he had um, a lovely connection, uh, collection of family archives. Um, so I kind of, I'm still, I'm still within that side of the family. But no, I'm, I'm often termed as Bruce's great-grandson. I don't know why. I've never claimed that. But no, I'm, I'm as I say, much much further removed from that. And we're gonna we're gonna have Bruce and um, or um, we're gonna have Cliff in sometime to chat with him too. 
<laughs> just have no to problem. get him healthy. <laughs> Let me know. Bruce, yeah. Bruce has a question. Yeah. Um, it's not exactly a question. It's uh, when you ask if your mood changed around uh, April 14th, April 15th, if you live in the United States, uh, a little levity here. If you live in the United States, April 15th is our tax day and many of us, our, our mood changes. <laughs> so. Oh, that's true. <laughs> I can tell you my father's mood changed. It <laughs> was a dark day. <laughs> when you had to pay uncle sam yeah <laughs> I, it always seemed to me that it was such a coincidence that uh mm -hmm. that eventually became uh the uh uh because i the titanic sank on april 15th and that's a day that uh you know <laughs> we all have to pay our taxes now okay. this is the book I don't know, know if you how long everyone's been with the book club, but this was voted. There's a tie for first place, and their book was voted book of the year um, last year. So if you haven't picked up a copy, it's a really touching book. Put a link in the chat. If you want to ask anyone who's read the book, please write a review. We love reviews. Oh, Oh, we I really love when people give reviews also I really because that helps other people know if they you know whether they should buy it or not that's right anyone else have a question Greg Greg you can put a question in the chat if you'd like I put the link for the book in the this was so nice. I was so glad you were all able to come and be together. And, and Mark, we missed seeing you, but it was so nice to hear you. Just before we go, I, could I just jump in for one second? Is the book available over on the new pages? Say again. Is the book available in the UK or just stateside? Oh, he wants to know if you can get it in the UK also. Oh, yes. Yeah. It, just on Amazon.com, you can buy the ebook for $4.95, or you can get the uh, paperback for, I believe it's $22.95. Lovely. I'll make a bail on for that. Thank you. It's wonderful. Bye. <laughs> Thank you, Jill, really, for hosting us. I appreciate it. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad. And, you know, when you look at this book, you know, I'm just gonna, not going to give too many spoilers, but it's like a photo album. I mean, <laughs> it's really wonderful. And I really enjoyed, I really felt like I got to know the family and, and Bertha and really well through, through all the pictures. It's probably the most, you know, pictures I've seen, you know, when you're talking about uh, Titanic's, you know, passengers. Um, it was really That's Mark. He was the one that brought us all those photos. Yeah, I found like I found slides that I never knew existed, and then I had them digitized. So all the colored ones are from those slides. And I've collected all the pictures all over the years. He's quite a photographer, too. You can see him on, uh, he has a, a Facebook page, old. Um, Old images old of image. Rhode, old images of Rhode Island, and how many uh, people are now on that? Over thirty-two thousand. Thirty-two thousand people. <laughs> so if if you want to join Mark's uh, website, it's old images of Rhode Island, and you'll see a lot of uh, his photos and photography and his life in Providence. Now. Is it on Facebook or is it its own? It's a it's a Facebook page. Well, old images of Rhode Island. Right, I'm going to see if I can find it and then I can put it in the chat here. And I post pictures. I, a lot of my old family pictures are on there. And then people post pictures of Rhode Island and, you know, things from the past. It's very fascinating. Oh, I think I found it. 31,000 members. I'll put it in the. I'll show it here. 
Now we are the old images of Rhode Island. <laughs> wow, yeah. So do you know if people buy the ebook, do they get to see the pictures? Or how does that Oh happen? yes, definitely. The oh, ebook so. is a great is a great bargain because it, it has every single photograph in it and they're in color. Great. Oops. I'll answer that after. <laughs> I have to answer the security questions. But I put a link in the chat for everyone. Yeah, I really hope everyone picks it up and everyone that has read it. I, gosh, I don't remember if I've given a review, so I will do that as soon as the meeting is over. I really appreciate you taking time to come and speak with us. And um, if someone has a question for you that wasn't able to be here today, is there a way for them to reach you? Um, sure, they can email uh, Mark or me. Um, if you want, I can get in Mary. No, no, I'm just saying goodbye because I'm leaving. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Mary. We're so glad you came. That was such a nice treat. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye, Mary. So they can just message me and I can yeah. give them your... Um... They can reach us on email. I have a jcpetarudi at verizon.net uh, email account. And Mark has uh, markpetarudi at gmail.com. It's, it's mark, mark Petarudi. Oh, Mark P -E -T, dot. Mark dot. P-E-T-T-E-R-U-T-I at gmail.com. Okay, I'll put those in the chat too. Great. Aww. So it's been, it's been great. Thank you. This was so nice. Thank you for helping us kick off our, our events. We haven't done one in a while. Yeah, thank you for sharing that story. It was wonderful to hear. Thank you so Oh, and Greg said thank you so much for coming and sharing your story and for a very interesting and informative conversation. Thank you, Greg. Thank you for coming, Greg and Terry and Cliff and Bruce. Hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Jill, thank you for getting us all together. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, I'm so grateful. Mark and Joseph and I have been talking for a while, so we finally got it together here. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank bye bye, you. everyone. Okay. Thank bye. you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.